Hello and welcome to Sunday Politics. He's the longest serving unionist leader. Could Jim Allister's party make a significant impact on the general election results here? The TUV leader joins me live. School principals tell this programme it's now impossible to balance their budgets. We are having to operate as a charity. We're not a charity, but we are having to operate as one. It's, it's unsustainable, never mind in the long term, it's unsustainable in the short term. The chair of the Assembly's Education Committee is here to give us his reaction to that. And joining me with her thoughts on all of that and more, the political analyst, Dr Claire Rice. It's almost a month since the TUV announced an electoral pact with the Reform Party, a move that could see the two parties standing united candidates across all of Northern Ireland's 18 constituencies in the forthcoming general election. Winning a seat might be a tough ask for a party that didn't stand a single candidate back in 2019, but could its presence on the ballot paper this time cause problems for the DUP, and in particular its new interim leader, Gavin Robinson. Jim Allister joins me now. Welcome to the programme. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Alistair. Um, we know the former DUP leader, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, has been charged with rape and other historical sexual offences. Those are charges which he denies and says he will strenuously contest. You've accused the DUP of doubling down on what you've called the tainted Donaldson deal, but um, what do you make of the change in language, I wonder, from Gavin Robinson? Uh, in interviews last week, he said, there is still an Irish sea border, though the work is underway to remove it. Do you welcome that change in tone from the DUP? Well, there's certainly no change in substance because what Gavin said was that he, his first priority was maintaining the Stormont arrangements, which, of course, are the implementation arrangements, uh, instead of saying uh, that he wanted to restore our place fully within the United Kingdom, that he wanted the Irish Sea border gone. No, Gavin's priority is to maintain the very implementation structures which are Stormont. So I don't see any change of substance, yes. Of course, Sir Geoffrey grossly over, uh, oversold it. He told us there was no Irish Sea border, zero uh, checks, zero paperwork, that our place is wholly restored within the United Kingdom, all which were patently false. Here, uh, here's the I'm point, sure... though, Jim Allister. Ian Paisley said Mr Robinson has now moved away from spin, as he put it, on the deal, to a solid basis of truth. Is that a victory for the TUV? Maybe it's a tacit admission that you had a point. Well, we have many points, but uh, uh, the, the reality is there's no change of substance. The, the key kernel of the issues pertaining to the protocol are these, that under the EU law to which we're subjected is the EU Customs Code, which operates on the basis that GB is a foreign country and we are EU territory. None of that has changed. On top of that, you have 300 plus laws, uh, uh, which we can never change, applicable from the EU, which... Very significantly are the identical laws affecting the goods economy and the agri-food industry and much of the environment of the Irish Republic, hence the obvious alignment in that direction. Uh, and the plan of the protocol clearly is a unification of Ireland. My plan, okay, so, is, so if that's the case, My plan is reunification of the United Kingdom. Right, OK. If, if that is the case and you believe that there has been no substantive change on the part of the DUP and that the Irish sea border remains a clear and present threat. You presumably have a duty to give every unionist voter the chance to make their voices heard by voting for a TUV or a reform candidate when the election comes around. That's simple, is it not? Well, that's, that's the purpose of our uh, uh, memorandum of understanding to say that. And, uh, you know, I've been astounded how some political commentators seem to think that the one, per the one category of people in Northern Ireland who shouldn't be allowed a ballot and allowed a, a voice are those who dare to dissent from the present sellout arrangements. Well, so sorry. just to be uh, clear... The determination is, is to make sure that every unionist, where that's possible, is given that opportunity. OK. Is it your intention then, just clarify this for us once and for all, on the record today, is it your intention as the leader of the TUV to run anti-protocol candidates from either your party or reform in each and every of the 18 constituencies come the general election? That certainly is the, is the aspiration and intention. Uh, it's an aspiration. Can you not just say that you're going to well, do it? Why would you not we, be We able haven't to do it? named 18 candidates, but no. yes, that is our. I said it was our intention to, to seek to do that because I think that uh, those who are discomforted 
by the fact that we're no longer a full part of the United Kingdom, but we're in part ruled by foreign law, subject to a foreign court, okay. uh, and have lost our integral position in the United Kingdom. I think all those people are entitled to have their say up on that. Okay, so it's an aspiration, it's an intention. But in a, at an anti-protocol rally in Sandy Row on Thursday night, you said, let me quote you, TUV gave the DUP a clear run in the 2019 general election to deliver a proper Brexit. They failed and brought us the protocol. And even with no TUV to blame, they lost unionism three seats. Imagine yeah. how much worse it could be this time with the TUV to blame. Sorry, there are no DUP seats. Once the election is called, no party has any seats. They are the people's seats. And it is for the people to decide. And are you suggesting that the people who think that this is a bad deal, that we've been sold out on this deal, that, are, that we need to reunify uh, the United Kingdom, shouldn't have a vote? Uh, I, I certainly think they do. And if yeah, the but in having those of, votes, they the could cost unionism unions, seats. That's the point. Places like uh, Lagan Valley and East Belfast, I'm sure you've looked at the numbers. You know the details. Of course you do. You know there will be um, very tight contests, and it will be difficult, potentially, for the DUP to hold on to those two seats, maybe a well, few others see, as well. And the, the entry of the end. TUV or reform into those contests could cost the DUP those seats. You see, you're falling into the trap again of some sort of divine right for the DUP to hold seats. They are the people's seats. And if the greater number of unions reject this Donaldson deal, then it's dead in the water. And that's the opportunity they'll be given. And why shouldn't they be? Well, yeah. Do you actually think there there's a difference, of course, being a, a party that runs as a, as a, as a party of protest uh, and a party that actually has a chance of, of winning seats? Because you didn't run any candidates, remember, back in 2019. Um, and I just wonder, do you seriously think you can actually win seats? So, so the BBC is now second-guessing the view of the electorate. They probably did the same thing in 1974 uh, when unheard of unionist candidates swept the boards. Uh, they probably yeah. did. Well, the you same won. Thing back you know, then. let's 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 remember you you won one seat in the assembly and you didn't stand at the last general election. So if you look at past performance, uh, it's it's hard to see how the TUV might win seats. Of course, you might you might. But but here's another point. In the past, you have called oh, the sorry, Alliance Party with, crypto nationalists. Hang on, let me make this point. point. You have in the past called the Alliance Party crypto nationalists. Isn't there a real chance that voters in Lagan Valley or in East Belfast could end up with Alliance MPs, non-unionist MPs, if you run? Well, you've made two points. Let me deal with them. Okay. Uh, the TUV, yes, we won MLA because of the vagaries of PR, but we did have 66,000 first preference votes in an election where the DUP was essentially saying largely the same thing. Now the DUP has somersaulted from protocol opponents to protocol implementers. Yeah, I and in the more recent council many, election, you got 29,000 votes sorry, and more. nine councillors, and the made, DUP got 122 councillors. Worth bearing that in mind. Sorry, Mark. You have, uh, yes, also at a time when the DUP was holding to their seven deaths. Where are they gone? Uh, but uh, so, so there, there is a substantial base. But democracy is about letting the people decide. And you know, the people might well decide that there's not much difference between a protocol implementer if they are a protocol implementer, no matter what flag they fly. Uh, so I am determined that there will be a very clear distinction between those who want to re reunify the United Kingdom, want rid of their obscenity that GB is decreed in customs terms to be a foreign country, we want rid of the obscenity that were ruled by foreign laws, uh, and the BBC seems to think they shouldn't be given the right even to vote. No, well, the sorry, BBC doesn't think anything that like right that, and you know you. that very well. There is every possibility the DUP or reform could split the unionist vote, just as David Vance did when he ran against Peter Robinson back in 2010, and the Alliance Party's Naomi Long won the seat. It well, could I happen say, again. I, is that a risk must, worth taking? That's my question. I, I must say I'm intrigued by the overwhelming concern of this programme for the future of people like Gavin Robinson, etc. It, it, it seems as if you have a political agenda in that. Surely, surely the agenda should be to the, say to the people of Northern Ireland, here are your choices. Now you make them free and, and uh, as you wish. Of course, uh, well, that's exactly what will happen, but it's perfectly reasonable it for you to press you on thing? some of the issues which are part of the public conversation relating to the forthcoming general election. And I apologise for the slight delay on the line. Can I ask you this? Are you intending to run as a candidate, as the leader of the TUV and as that party's standard bearer? Will you put your name in front of the electorate come the general election? And if so, well, that, where? 
Well, that hasn't been decided yet. For someone who's well, what's your gut feeling? That, sorry, sorry. For someone who's very anxious, there should be no TUV candidates, lest we upset the apple cart of the protocol. You're now very keen to know if I'm going to run. Well, you'll just have to wait and see. Uh, so you don't know at this point. I may know, but I'm not telling you. Well, why would you not? Why would you? Well, it's not me you're telling. It's the people who are watching this program. It's the because electorate. There, if you're intending to run, why would you not say? There's a time and a place uh, for these decorations, and that time and that place will come. OK, um, very, very quickly, Gavin Robinson has said he'd be very keen to talk to the TUV about some of the issues that have come up uh, in the public discourse over the past couple of weeks. Are you prepared to have that conversation, just briefly? <laughs> well, let me just remind you, Gavin Robinson was the man who shot down a TUV, proposi TUV proposition that we could have a single party for this okay. election and a single candidate. He's the man who shot it down, so we're rather intrigued that now okay. he's wanted to talk. But if he wants to talk about returning to the path of the United Unionist Declaration, which is where unionism was united before the DUP and the Ulster Unionists divided it by departing from that declaration, then I'm happy to, to, to talk about, it, about an agenda to reunite the United Kingdom instead of his agenda okay. of uh, promoting the unification of Ireland through a protocol. All right, got to leave it there. I'm afraid we're out of time. Jim Allister, thanks very much indeed. No doubt we will talk again before too long. Let's get some analysis of that now from uh, Dr. Claire Rice. Welcome to you. What did you make of that overall? We covered a lot of ground. A lot of ground, yes. Um, I thought there, there wasn't really much there that we haven't heard before, but it was particularly interesting when you were pressing around the issue of whether or not um, the TUV standing in all constituencies would split the unionist vote, that there was almost a defence mechanism seemed to come into play there. Um, I, I, it's very surprising at this stage, or it would be very surprising, I should say, if the TUV wouldn't be open to the idea of pacts going forward fundamentally across all the unionist parties, despite their different political interests and how they represent it. They ultimately want to see Northern Ireland represented in a unionist perspective within Westminster. So if that fundamental core point comes through, I would be very surprised if there aren't at least some pacts in certain constituencies that would come forward. Yeah, well, that's very interesting because he says there that uh, it is his aspiration, it is his intention to run either a TUV or a reform candidate in each and every of the 18 constituencies. He says, why would that not be the case if we believe that our analysis is correct and the analysis of other unionist parties is wrong, don't people have the right to vote for that? And, and of course that is a perfectly valid argument. But there is a risk that comes with that, which Jim Allister must be very aware of. And when you look at what happened in 2010 in East Belfast, it could happen again in more than one place, potentially at this coming election. Absolutely. And I would be very surprised again if, if Jim Allister, given his experience within electoral politics in Northern Ireland, isn't as acutely aware of that as some of the commentators out there that he made reference to. He doesn't to. want to talk about it, though. He doesn't want to talk about it. And to an extent, you can't blame him for that because it is it is volatile ground at this stage, let's say. I think there's a lot of game still to be had before the general election. He will come under huge pressure from the DUP not to potentially split the unionist vote, won't he? Absolutely. And I think um, effectively from the DUP's perspective that, yes, they're looking towards the TUV not to be split in the vote, but there's also that concern that if there's too many voices within unionism, too many candidates and constituencies, that could pave the way to the likes of the Alliance Party and, and more constituencies coming forward. So there's challenges coming from all directions um, on unionism and with the DUP in particular. Well, already it's uh, shaping up to be a fascinating campaign, isn't it? Claire, um, stay there. We'll talk to you a little bit later in the programme for now. Thanks very much indeed. Well, let's turn to the crisis facing our schools. Next, principals have told this programme that it's impossible to balance their budgets and that in some cases they feel as if they're acting as charities just to fund the basic services. Shortly, we'll hear from the chair of Stormont's Education Committee, but first Darren Marshall spoke to two primary school heads, Chris Curry from Kalinchy and first Sean Dillon from Primate Dixon in Coal Island. Sean, we're here at the start of the financial year. What are the challenges for you looking forward to now between now and, and the start of the new school year in September? Well, quite obviously budget is one and making sure we're able to operate fully and successfully within that. But also we, we are looking ahead to what the situation will be for our school in about 18 months time because we are in a situation here where we have two learning support centres and a key stage one autism support centre. Now we, we can see whenever we look at the numbers that we have never mind all the children who would like to be placed here, that in September of 2025, we will not have the provision for them existing in school. As it stands, there is the very great risk that a number of children who have been moving from P4 will not have placement here in Primate Dixon 
and we want to avoid that at all costs. School budgets last year for the last couple of years have been flat, where we, every school has run on the, the same amount per pupil, unchanged compared to previous years. Well, if you looked at our school's budget, our three-year plan, you would see the plan for this year, the plan for next year, the plan for following year is all based on the assumption that the amount per pupil remains the same. That simply cannot, cannot stay the case. That is something that just has to change. Salary will obviously eat up a large part of your school budget. In particular, um, special education needs assistance. Yeah. How vital a role do they play? We simply couldn't operate without those people and the work that they do. Um, I, I do think it, the executive now need to, to recognise the work that these people do uh, and the way to recognise that is in the payment that they're given. And Sean, you're here 20 years. How has the job changed from when you arrived to what it's like now? We're seeing big increases in the, the, the numbers of children with their own particular needs. I mean, when, when I came to the school 20 years ago, we had three, three children with statements of special education. Today, we have 72. There has grown up within the school a huge a range of expertise, knowledge and commitment to, to meeting the needs of every child. It, it takes a lot before we, we will say to a parent, we can't meet the needs of your child. Um, very, very rarely ever happens. As a principal, is it worth it all? Oh, absolutely, yeah. It's a tremendously worthwhile job. You say, is, is, is the job of being the principal of a school like this worthwhile? Absolutely. Chris, one of your jobs is balancing the budget. How difficult is that at the minute? Uh, it's not a matter of whether it's difficult, it's, it's nigh on impossible, it can't be done. We, um, we simply don't have enough money coming in from the Department of Education um, to run our school. Um, in, in old money, in days gone by, maybe if we go back eight or nine years ago, we would have perhaps spent maybe up to around 90 to 95 percent on staffing, which would have left us anywhere between five and 10 percent for resources and uh, running costs of the school. But the reality of it is now that our basic staffing that we need to run the school is well in excess of 100 percent of our budget. So therefore the books can, can't be balanced, it's not possible to do that. So what have you sacrificed in that attempt to limit the damage? Uh, in the recent, I would say in the last couple of years, good examples in our school would be the um, purchase of a new reading scheme that cost about nine, ten thousand pounds and it's a huge amount of money to, to try and uh, find in a school budget which we just didn't have. So we had to raise that money. Um, and to do that, it took about two years for the PTA to pull together that money to, to purchase that reading scheme. Same thing can be said for some of our interactive touch panels and things all around the school. So you recently had to fundraise for something as important as a whiteboard. We really did have to raise funds for those because they would be deemed a purchase that wouldn't be essential for day-to-day -day operation in the school. And In this day and age though? How is that not essential? It absolutely is essential, there's no doubt about that, uh, but due to the, the cost involved, uh, there are certain measures put in place by the Education Authority to uh, manage and limit spends on capital items. I would imagine that had we not been able to purchase one um, or a series of them that we may have had to take them physically off the wall and return to whiteboards and maybe data projectors and things like that, sort of um, slightly more dated methods just to get us by. How much of your time as a as an educator, as a principal, as a teacher, it's spent as a fundraiser? I would say too much. Um, there's many, many better things that I can be doing with my time and focusing upon mainly to do with the education and welfare of the children. Uh, but far, far too much of my time is spent um, fundraising for essential resources and services that the school needs. Um, we are having to operate as a charity. We're not a charity, but we are having to operate as one far more than we really should be and that's, that's something that's, that needs to change. 
Chris Curry and before that, Sean Dillon. You can read more of what the two principals had to say over on the BBC News NI website, but let's get some reaction to what we just heard from Nick Matheson, Chair of the Assembly's Education Committee. Welcome to you. Those two principals head up schools that are uh, 50 miles apart, but their messages are very similar. Both are effectively in debt before they even switch on a light at the start of the financial year. Yes, and I should just say at the outset, I, I serve as a governor in Kalinchi Primary School, um, but I'm speaking in, in my capacity as the, as the, the chair of the, uh, the Education Committee and Alliance Education spokesperson today. Look, the situation for schools is absolutely unsustainable. Um, that was very, very clear from both those principles from different locations in Northern Ireland. But it is very much a scenario before a light is turned on, schools are struggling to balance the books. But we've known about this for years and the budget for schools, it was suggested it's been flat. It has actually in some cases been squeezed and reduced that aggregated schools budget um, year on year. And that is not sustainable. So schools, there are, there are many aspects to this, but schools do need more money to actually be able to deliver education for our children. Yes, yeah, so schools acting as charities in this day and age, principals working as fundraisers. I mean, many people will, first of all, perhaps be surprised to hear that and will think it is absolutely not acceptable. That's not the way the system's meant to work. Absolutely not. And I think schools are very, very good at masking this. Schools put on a really, really good front for, for parents because they want schools to be places where they, they are confident their children are being educated uh, with, with the proper resources and proper facilities. But behind that, um, you know, we, we literally in some cases have buildings that are crumbling. Uh, and again, where we're hearing about fundraising for what I would consider to be basic essential resources for yeah, us. And, and it is purely a coincidence, I should say, that, um, that, that, that you are here today. You're in here today in your capacity as, as chair of the Education Committee. It's a coincidence that you happen to be a governor at uh, Kalinchi Primary School. But we now know um, that the chair of Stormont's Education Committee is involved in a school where the principal has to go and fundraise for a functioning interactive whiteboard which costs thousands of pounds and a, a new suite of books. And he says he's not unique in having to do that. He is absolutely not unique. I mean, I speak to principals all across Northern Ireland and this rule and, and that that is a, just a common theme uh, that, that that sort of charitable approach to getting resources is necessary I think there's there's three things I would want to say the amount of money is not enough and um, so we need to look how Northern Ireland is funded across the board and we need to be funded that is in line with our with with need and that is a matter that Westminster needs to progress how schools are funded is also an issue. The common funding formula has been cited as needing an overhaul and a radical review and reform for years. Education department has not, not gone near that and that is vital that that happens. And the third thing is the system is not sustainable. We run a divided education system and we need to actually do the serious structural reform so that we can be sure that the money we're spending is getting to where it's needed, which is into schools to educate children. Um, there are a couple of other points I want to pick up on uh, from those uh, contributions. On Thursday, your committee heard that there are problems finding places for children with special educational needs and 100 schools uh, reportedly have refused to create new specialist classes for children with SEN. And yet here we have a principal publicly urging the authorities to take action and to allow him to create additional places, which he needs and wants to do. What's going on there? Because those two positions are clearly at odds with each other. Very much so. Uh, and if anybody you know, watched the Education Committee uh, on, on Wednesday, there was some debate uh, as to whether or not the, the term crisis was, was appropriate uh, to use in this scenario. Uh, and I am very clear that this is a crisis. But regrettably, it's a crisis that's repeated year in, year out. So there has been an absolute failure of planning uh, to deliver uh, for places for children with special educational needs. It is very concerning to hear a principal saying that they are approaching the department saying we need uh, this this additional provision we are ready to, to make it happen and that it's not being delivered so there, there's there is a failure in planning year in year out both departmentally and at the ea the problem is that when you look at the evidence that was given to your committee a senior official at the department seemed to be suggesting that the problem was with the schools now we have a school principal saying that the problem is not with the schools they want to get on with it but they can't because the department won't let them yeah and the message that i hear from schools very clearly as well is that while they may be very open uh, to, to uh, creating more places for children with special educational needs, they are not confident that they will be resourced financially or supported to meet those children's needs. We need to be placing children where their needs will be met. Uh, and I think this is, again, just a, a, an example of how years of, of managing something as, a, as an emergency response, as a crisis response, and not putting in the necessary planning gets us into a scenario now where we are 
looking at potentially a thousand places uh, that, that are, are as yet to be identified for some children with profound additional needs. And we also heard there in those contributions just how vital the contribution is of classroom assistants. Sean Dillon um, said that his school simply could not function without them. What's your message to the people who control Stormont's purse strings as far as that's concerned? It was very welcome uh, to hear Sean referencing the contribution of classroom assistance because, again, that, that was something that came up at Education Committee. There is a real problem, a real crisis in the workforce. We, we can't reform how we deliver special educational needs provision if we don't have the staff available to actually uh, carry, carry out uh, the work with those children. So the pay and grading review um, was very welcome. Uh, that, that, that's, that's a review that has been just approved by the Department of Finance to try and address some of the issues, or issues around the pay in terms and conditions for classroom assistance. I mean, I think the, the message has to be very simple. Our education system can't function without these staff, um, so, so that the money will need to be found. It, it's, it's, it's a non-negotiable, effectively. But there are huge pressures on money left, right and centre. And for the department, which is bidding for additional funds from finance, just as many other departments, which are also under pressure, are doing, it is hard to see how all of those demands can be met within education and within all of the government departments at Stormont. Without a doubt. And that brings me back to, to, to my previous points, that uh, we, we do need to look at the funding settlement, how much we actually receive in our block grant to fund education. But we need to have a minister who is serious about structural reform of our education system so we can spend our money as effectively as possible. OK, Nick Matheson, thanks very much indeed. should just say on that, we have invited the Minister Paul Given to come into the studio um, um, for the view to discuss those challenges referenced by the head teachers, and we, we do hope that he'll be able at some stage soon to take up that invitation. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Let's just have a quick final word with uh, Claire Rice, who's been listening to that. Um, there are a lot of issues in that. It's really densely packed with real challenges for the department, for individual schools, their principals in particular, um, uh, and for the Department of Finance that has to try to magic up this money. Yeah, it just goes to show the extent of issues that there are in Northern Ireland that have been exacerbated by the stop-start politics of the last number of years. Yet, yeah, it's an important resource that needs to be financed adequately. We've seen the problems. We know basic essentials in schools and fundraising for those. Going right back to COVID, we've been hearing principals screaming from the rooftops about the issues that they've been facing. So this is very much an ongoing problem, as has been mentioned here. But it's one that really needs to be addressed urgently because for Northern Ireland to be looking to its future economically, you need to start investing in, in the youth coming through and education is, is a key uh, tenet to that, uh, that that progress going forward. Uh, and as Nick Matheson suggested, uh, and there may well be some <laughs> truth in this, it's a bit of a hidden issue because unless you're directly involved as a, as a parent or as a governor or as a teacher, you maybe don't know that this is an issue within our schools. It's so different to what it was like just a short number of years ago. Absolutely. I, I, I'm far enough out of school that, that it's uh, probably not accurate to say that it's any time recent for myself, but I'm a new mum and I know looking towards education for my own son going forward, these are issues that I wasn't aware of in, in their full depth until I started having to look into it. It's, it's one of a plethora of issues that Northern Ireland's having to deal with now, but it's one of the most urgent ones it needs dealt with. OK, um, we will leave it there. Claire, thanks very much indeed uh, for coming in to join us. Good to see you. Um, that's all we've got time for today. I'll be back with The View on Thursday night, which is at the later time of 10 past 11. If that's too late for you, it will, as always, be available afterwards on the BBC iPlayer. From everyone on the Sunday Politics team, thanks for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye.